Right, so continuing on with um, our climate change chapter, um, we're going to look at some of the effects of climate change. So we've already talked about some of them, um, but anyway, we'll just go through these. So some of the effects are rising sea levels, um, shrinking glaciers, storms and floods, heat waves, drought. Um, so just briefly, I talked about this one already, um, the melting of the glaciers, polar ice sheets and sea ice occurs when the temperature increase causes the ice to change its state, uh, more water flows into the ocean and then you've got obviously more water in the Earth's ocean so that increases the level and then because it's a little bit warmer water expands when it's heated and um, so that causes to rise even more. So the calculations are that the sea levels have risen between 10 and 20 centimetres in the last 100 years. Um, so the main issue with that is that if you have the sea levels higher that um well for coastal towns and cities and um, that could be a problem because the water will start to basically come in at the edge and um, another problem is because the water the, the problem we're experiencing at the moment i should say is that because the water is that bit higher that if there is rain or anything like you know quite a bit of rain or storms or things like that areas are flooding much more quickly so whereas before it might take I don't know 10 consecutive days of heavy rain to cause a flood in an area which is you know 10 consecutive days of rain is it's quite a lot and um, now it might only take four or five consecutive days of rain to cause that flood because the oceans started at a higher level so they don't need as much water to flood so you are seeing around the world more flooding happening happening a lot more easily as in with less kind of rain um causing it shrinking glaciers uh, so a glacier you might learn this in geography if you do geography is a river of ice and um, glaciers are formed when snow does not completely melt away in the summer and then with each uh, with each year when you get extra snow the snow kind of becomes compacted and compressed and then, I mean, over a very long time, thousands of years, the accumulation of these solid layers form a glacier. Um, so glaciers are very important for people who live near them because um, they depend on the melt water from the glaciers. That's their fresh water, it's their drinking water. Um, and what's happening is that the world's glaciers, again, they're melting and they're receding. I got some pictures here. Um, see if you look here. So this is the same area you can see that it's the same area um, in 1913 and 2012 and look at the difference like here is your glacier here covering quite a substantial amount of land whereas here you've just got this little bit here and there was another one so here 1913 and uh, this i thought this showed the idea of it retreating they talk about glaciers retreating so because it's essentially a frozen river it comes down to here and then what happens is it starts to retreat from here and just moves back 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 so here you've only got the glacier coming to like it's kind of about this point in the picture okay it's also not as wide okay so that's you can see the retreating of the glacier and um, there's some good pictures online if you have a look uh, storms and floods so uh, warmer waters in our oceans give strength to storms making them more powerful so um, every winter obviously now we're so aware of the storms that we have because they're all named um but i don't know if you remember um going back when you get some of these really really powerful storms that start as hurricanes like off the coast of america or in the gulf of mexico and things like that kind of around florida and um, the reason they have such powerful dangerous storms is because their oceans are so warm and um, i'm not sure if anybody's been to Mexico or Florida but if you get in the ocean in the summer it's like a bath like they're so hot so they maintain a lot of that temperature in the winter then they're nowhere near as cold as like you know the Atlantic Ocean is or the Irish Sea and um, and when you have that warm water in the oceans it gives energy to storms so that's why by the time these hurricanes come across the Atlantic Ocean and reach us and um, that they don't have that power anymore is because they've traveled across so much cold water that by the time they get to us they're just we just are the oceans that surround ireland are too cold 
to continue to give it energy so it gets downgraded so what was a hurricane um becomes a storm so we had Ophelia when was that was that two years ago um, and it was originally a hurricane and but by the time it got to us it was downgraded and it was just storm Ophelia was a hurricane um, so having you know there were certain parts of the world that always had warm oceans and um, like the uh, areas are in the Caribbean and things that the oceans are warm there and um, but <clears throat> what's happening then is you've more areas that have more warm oceans so then you've got more oceans that can support these really 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 strong storms and give them power and um, so obviously that's not um, good in terms of increasing storms and as a result floods and um, so then going to the other end of it heat waves um, so that's when the normal temperature of the region is much greater than previous temperatures so like um, I'd imagine the weather we've been having for the last two weeks three weeks in Ireland is probably well above um, normal temperatures for this time of the year um, we don't I suppose we don't see the heat waves much here but I mean you just have to look at what happened in Australia earlier this year and the height of their summer and the like the fires and it happened in was it California before that in Amer um, at the end of last summer and um, so in areas that already have kind of reasonably high temperatures they are now going off the charts um, and if you look here I think this is quite a nice little bit well nice scary whatever way you look at it uh, nine of the ten warmest years on record have taken place since 2000 so since 2000 you know that's 20 years and nine of the 10 hottest years on record have happened in those 20 years like that's quite stark um, and then the last one then is drought so if you have a heat wave taking place then you um a lot of the time drought will follow which is a lack of sufficient supply of water um i mean you see how quickly in Ireland if we have a couple of hot days and like let's be fair for us it's a couple of hot days like you know it might be two weeks of weather and all of a sudden we're water restrictions you know there isn't enough water, water restrictions so you know what's that going to be like in countries that are you know far hotter and they go much longer spells without any rain um, and they don't have kind of a proper water infrastructure I'm mean, not that ours is great but you know we do have an infrastructure or water system and um, so drought can occur very quickly in certain parts of the world and um, another couple of stark figures here by 2025 five years time 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity um, and by 2030 almost half the world's population will be living in areas of high water stress Okay, so they are massive numbers and it's kind of something that needs to be handled. Um, so just briefly to look at a carbon footprint, I mentioned it I think when I was correcting the homework. So it's a measure of the amount of carbon that is produced from the activities carried out by humans. Um, so a lot of the time if you're doing now, if you're doing a building project or running your business or things like that, you need to kind of figure out what your carbon footprint is. Um, You'll see it quoted on a lot of companies that they have a low carbon footprint, you know, things like that. Um, so yeah, anything, anything you do. So for the electricity required to power a video game, uh, the fossil fuel required by a car, a train or a bus. So, you know, if you get in your car and you drive to work, that has a carbon footprint. If you get on a bus, I mean, the fact that you're sharing your carbon footprint with many other people so whatever the cost of the journey whatever the cost of the journey um, it's going to be it's going to be less um, if you're spreading it among like the hundred people that were on the bus with you um, having a small carbon footprint is much better than having a large one so you want to have a small carbon footprint you don't want a large one um, and I suppose, I, I think I, I read this here the other day, we can look at ourselves and see what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and reduce our own carbon footprint. And sort of this idea of the power of one, and I think kind of 
in dealing with this uh, virus at the moment. We can see the power that people have. I mean, the government can put, you know, they can give additional PPE to the hospitals. They can, um, they can give them more ventilators and things like that. But ultimately, if the people didn't weigh in and, you know, engage in social distancing and all the things that they're asking us to do, um, our hospitals would be overrun and we would have an infection that was completely out of control. So I would have always been a little bit kind of wary of this idea of like, oh, you can make a difference because I thought, well, you know, what difference can I make if a massive like, commercial company with thousands of employees all over the world, all running big factories every day are polluting the environment? And they are, but I suppose you need to kind of, I, I can see with what's happening with this virus, the power that if everybody did something, it would make a big difference, you know? So anyway, um, for your homework, I'll send you the link, but I want you to figure out, I did it this morning, it's quite interesting, um, I want you to calculate your carbon footprint. So I'll give you this Just One Earth um, link, and you just basically go through and answer all the questions as best you can. Um, I mean, some of them will be different for you because, you know, you're not adults, so you're not kind of, you're not in charge of your household and you can't make those things but it's interesting I think it's interesting it kind of made me think about a few things and um, I went around turning off appliances on standby there and um, so yeah so that's going to be your homework just calculate your carbon footprint and um, see kind of where you stand all right so you don't I mean, you can send it to me if you want if you have any comment to write on it that would be interesting to see what you thought of your carbon footprint but um, there's no um, no, do you know what? I kind of want everyone to do this. So figure out what your carbon footprint is. So it says it here. Your carbon footprint is X amount per year. And send it to me. And then send me three things you think you could change to improve your carbon footprint. Okay, so for next Tuesday, work out your carbon footprint. And then suggest three ways you think based on answering these questions that you could improve like I noticed that I leave a lot of appliances and standby I looked around my kitchen and I love the switches that were powered on and so I thought well it'd be easy for me to go around and even and just knock those switches off like it took a minute and so there's one way I could improve my carbon footprint so I want you to think of three ways that you could improve your carbon footprint okay all right have a good week